When did you start at HCC? The year? Oh, I don't know. I think it was uh, the end of 2016. But I met you in 2017, though. Yes, that makes sense. That's the timeline I was trying to place, because I started at HCC in August 2016, and I believe I got involved with the club right away. Um, and then you came in your second semester, right, and yes. joined Saga, which was the Gay Straight Alliance at the time, or the GSA. So. Yeah, and my impression of the club was it was very welcoming. I, uh, you and Tara Rupp, who works at the Wellness Center, you were the faculty advisors at the time, and you were very, um, you were very good about keeping the, uh, the meeting structured, but also still like fun and engaging. It was always very, uh, I don't know, low key conversational. I think I was worried it was going to be too much about social justice when I went in there because I wasn't prepared to <laughs> do that. So I was glad that it was mostly it was like a social group. We have evolved in that front but it was good for me at the time to have uh, no official expectations of me. Absolutely, and when you joined, again, we were the Gay Straight Alliance and we actually met twice a week because we had yeah. so many students, it was difficult to find a single meeting time. So I believe we would meet something like Wednesday evenings and Thursday afternoons or, or something like that. Um, but yeah. then after you joined the club, you actually became one of my students in Speech uh, 101, which is Introduction to Human Communication. And my impression of you in that class is, uh, first of all, excellent public speaker. I know you don't think that you are, but you are. Okay. <laughs> and secondly, one thing that I really loved about having you as a student is that you weren't afraid to stand up for what you believe in and what you know is right. So I remember having conversations about gender identity and about sexuality and having some students in the class that were not really on board with different gender identities or different sexual orientations. And you, you were willing to go toe to toe and, and head to head with them and express how you felt in a way that was not, um, Belligerent. Belligerent, <laughs> off-putting was a word that I was oh, thinking, but good. you were able to express your mind very clearly. But at the same time, take that stance with, no, you're not, you're not gonna mess with me. <laughs> and I really appreciated that about you. Well, you made the environment feel safe for me to do that. Cause I, like, I wouldn't in necessarily in any other classroom, like I have to feel first, like I'm not gonna look like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so you made that possible for me. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, as far as the evolution of Saga goes, uh, it was several years ago, I think in the pandemic before times, that we changed our name to the Sexuality and Gender Alliance, or Saga. What do you remember about those conversations and why we did that? Uh, well, I mean, okay, so Gay Straight Alliance, I think we all felt that it felt too high school. And it was also, it's very um, narrow, obviously. Uh, it was, the intention, I guess, was to make it clear that we wanted allies to be interested, and we still do, but it felt ridiculous more and more as time went on and our uh, club leadership became less cisgender. It's felt more and more silly that we didn't even say trans in the title. We had one president who was asexual, non-binary, and then after that someone who was trans feminine and queer. And so we eventually got that done. I think we were two semesters of Saga before the school shut down. Yes. But we're going to be Saga once more in the fall. Absolutely. The thing I love about Saga, again, it, it just, like you mentioned, it's, it's so much more broad than the Gay Straight Alliance because as the membership of the club changes, the leadership of the club changes, we really do reflect the entire spectrum of identities and we welcome the entire spectrum of identities. And you mentioned something um, when, you know, straight is in the, the title that implies that it's queer people and allies. And I think it's important to note that Saga does not discourage allies from coming to the meetings, but the focus really is on our queer students and what do they need. Yeah, so. yeah, it was important, especially since we had a couple of people who were very uh, gun shy about coming and still the whole time they were in there, they're, they're shy about speaking up and that's fine, but we want to make sure people like that were on the fence about joining 
weren't staying away because they were worried there was too much focus on like, oh, let's meet in the marketplace of ideas about whether or not it's okay to be gay. I don't want people to have that impression of the club. Right. That's not what we're doing. Exactly. And that's a very clear statement that the club has in its bylaws and um, that we keep in mind as we're conducting our meetings is that we are there for our LGBTQ students. We are not there for people to come in and try to debate with us about our identities. We're not there for people who want to come in and ask a bunch of questions or try to get us to change our minds. We are there for the LGBTQ students. Yeah. Um, do you feel as though Saga is accepted on HCC's campus? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of resources, very normalized for people to just uh, like mention it casually. And I don't know who it was, I think it was Clint Neal, who got people to start putting pronouns in their uh, addresses and all their emails. That was a cool thing to start seeing. Like that started happening, I believe, or maybe I just started noticing it while I was here. But it was a great evolution of that. I've had so many uh, professors and instructors who were safe zone allies and they always mentioned that at the beginning of the classes. It just made everything feel uh, just uh, more welcoming and more uh, more comfortable for me as a student. Not that it would obviously necessarily come up. It was just good to know that if it would, those instructors would take uh, a protective stance. Like one time, I don't know which class it was. I think it was genetics. We were filling out some type of uh, survey, like demographic survey, and I just remember the question about <laughs> gender was very stupid. It was phrased like, "Are you uh, are you male, female, or transgender?" Or, or prefer not to say, that's my, my favorite gender. Uh, <laughs> but I brought it up to the instructor. I'm like, this is a little dumb looking. And she's like, oh, I agree with you. I'll, I'll mention somebody. I don't know if they changed that or not, because I have no idea who's in charge of that. But just that she was receptive to it and was like, oh, I see what you mean. That's very easily something I could imagine going differently. And that's like a very silly example, but it just came to mind. No, that's a great example. And that's one thing that I found as I do um, I do a lot of professional development on campus, and so what that means is faculty and staff take these professional development classes to learn more about how to be effective instructors, how to be effective staff members, how to work with students from all backgrounds. And so my primary focus when I lead these sessions is on um, sexuality and gender identity. And I've found faculty and staff to be very receptive yeah. to everything to changing the type of language that they use to um, changing the way that they teach things or the forms that they use in class or even when they introduce themselves right I say hi I'm Rachel Adams my pronouns are she and her and we talk a lot about how when you normalize things like sharing your pronouns it takes the burden off of other people who might be scared to share their pronouns or when you come out on the first day of class and you say, hey, I'm a safe zone ally and this is what that means and you can always come to me, that also just lets students know. Um, it, it can be really scary to sit in a classroom, especially if your name, the name that you go by is different than the one on the roster or um, you are in the process of coming out. It can be really, really scary. And when you know that your teacher or the person in admissions or in the registrar's office that you're talking to is an ally, that I think um, makes things a lot easier for students. Yeah, definitely. I would hope. <laughs> yeah, it, oh yeah, it does. And in regard to like the professional development that you're in charge of, I know when we have the the safe zone ally panels about educating uh, you know, new people who want to become. Uh, safe zone allies officially. I've sat on that I think one or two times and it is encouraging how uh, enthusiastic they are about asking questions even when you can tell people are not quite sure what to ask because it's a very personal thing to be like a spokesperson about. They do try their best and I appreciate that and uh, it's very um, like uh, friendly uh, exchange like I never felt like I was being uh, analyzed like a weirdo or something it was very uh, it was good. <laughs> That's been my experience. I found that, that people want to know, and that's the same sort of, of openness that I have in my professional development sessions where I say, I want you to feel comfortable asking me any question you have, even if you're not sure if your language is okay or you're not quite sure how to ask it, I'm not gonna get mad at you. I think that part of that openness really helps people understand us as humans I've, faculty and staff are always very interested in hearing about the student perspective because 
at our core, we are here to serve our students. We care about our students. So yeah, the experience that I've had is that folks, even when they're not quite sure how to ask the question, they really do want to know out of a genuine desire to be better yeah. for their students. Well, that's why I feel like it's important for me, uh, even though I was like, I'm a naturally kind of shy person, I felt it was important for me to become a club officer when I could because I am gay and trans and I have a high tolerance for, like I don't get offended very easily. So I want to be able to be an open book about that stuff and it was confusing for people. Cause I, I mean, it was confusing for me. It took me a very long time to even figure out what I was. So I understand uh, the uh, desire to learn, but also to be worried about uh, whether you're going to accidentally say something offensive. It was like, as long as you're trying not to, I think that's uh, good. <laughs> right. And I think it's important for people to know that you can't just walk up to any gay or queer or trans or non-binary person and be like, hey, I don't even know you, but let me ask you a bunch of questions. Yeah. And so that's why it's important to have these sessions where they can ask those questions of people that say, you know what, I'm okay with you asking this question. I'm fine. Um, but it's definitely not a thing that you want to do to just anybody. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I mean, I hope people know that just as a general rule, anything you don't want to do that, but yeah, especially something that sensitive. So obviously I am one faculty member of many, but I, the more I tell people about the way I run my classroom, I think the more people are interested in, in doing something similar. So our class begins on the first day. I introduce myself, I give my pronouns. I let students write down their names on an index card, whatever name they would like to be called. Yeah and to tell me their pronouns if they would like to. I don't ever force anybody to do that. And, you know, that lets me know a couple things. It's not just for the queer students in the class. We have plenty of students who go by their middle names or who go by a nickname. But that also allows students to alert me to the fact that their name is different than what's on the roster without me standing there calling it out in front of everybody, which can be a really sort of high pressure situation. And then the benefit is it also saves me mispronouncing everybody's name while I'm calling while I'm calling roll. So that's kind of a dual thing. Uh, one of the the things that I've gotten a lot of questions about is a policy that I have in my classroom that says something along the lines of um, if I ever unintentionally say or do anything that makes you uncomfortable or that is um, not inclusive in any sort of way, students are allowed to call me out on it. Yeah. And I will apologize and I will correct my behavior and it'll be different next time. And I always ask students what stood out to them most from the syllabus. And kind of across the board, they all say, I saw that line and I have never had a professor say to me before, you can tell me when I screw up and I will say I'm sorry. Yeah. And I think that's something really, really important as instructors that we need to remember is that we're not perfect. Um, and not only that, but I'm someone who is part of the LGBTQ community and I do all of this professional development and I still admit I don't know everything. Yeah. Things are changing constantly. We, you know, people always say things like, well, we didn't have all these identities back in my day. Well, no, you did. We just didn't have language for them. Yeah. And it's, it's great uh, because I'm like, I mean, I think there's a lot of faculty who it just doesn't occur to them to say something like that. And you're setting an example for them, but it's also good as a contrast to you. There are definitely some people, maybe not here at this great school, but other places where they're actively hostile to the idea of being challenged. I'm like, that's not a great learning environment. It's not a great social environment at all. And I think that type of thing just facilitates learning because you feel comfortable being able to engage on any subject matter, not just if you're challenging you about something uh, you've said that might be offensive to someone's identity. And uh, I know that being in your class made me feel a lot more confident to speak up about that type of stuff. I have a specific memory. I don't know if you'll recall this, but there was somebody who I don't know how it came up, but they were talking about how they thought a specific type of person, I won't go into specifics, but they said that they didn't think they should be allowed to have kids. And I remember most of the people in the class were very, like, they didn't know how to respond because that's such a severe thing to say. I, I pushed back a little bit and I felt comfortable doing that only because I knew that if it became hostile that you would, you would intervene and you would make sure this person didn't say anything abusive or crazy. 
And I mean, I came into your class uh, because I had known you already as the faculty advisor from Saga, but leaving it, I uh, can say I was a little bit inspired by you, and it was only after that that I became a club advisor. Is uh, you showed me a way to be uh, in charge of things, but in an egalitarian manner, not in like a. Uh, I'm a naturally authoritarian person. I needed that <laughs> inspiration to make sure I could do the job correctly. So thank you. Well, for thank that. you. That is one thing that can be difficult to strike the balance on, is people who have those opinions, even though we hear them and we think, no, they have a right to have those opinions, and so. It can be very uncomfortable. I mean, I've had students say to me that they didn't agree with gay people, that they didn't, um, you know, again, think that gay people should be able to get married or whatever. And that, okay, that's your opinion and you're allowed to, to have that. So for me, that's always a challenging part is allowing all students <laughs> to yeah. voice their opinion. The rule in the class is you can disagree with anybody, but you must be respectful. Yeah. We're not gonna call names. We're not gonna devolve into a shouting match. I mean, I teach communication and at the heart of communication is listening and respect and humility and willingness to change. Um, but that is something that can be very, very difficult yeah. to navigate. Um, I mean, the school in general is good about this, where they uh, facilitate differences of opinion while taking, I think, uh, an unambiguous line about certain things. Like, they sent out emails about Juneteenth, uh, about uh, Black Lives Matter protests, about, uh, you know, immigration uh, laws that were impacting students here. Like, they're very good about making sure people feel, I mean, to the extent that I can speak to that, uh, <laughs> they're very good at making students know that uh, they're welcome as a baseline. Like, yes, you're allowed to voice different opinions, but like you said, you need to make sure that you're not being hostile to other people. Yeah. And uh, that's something that I've been consistently happy with going to the school and like working here now, I keep getting these emails. It makes me happy to see those whenever they come down the pike. <laughs> that is one thing I was so proud of HCC. Uh, several years ago at the federal level, um, the guidance changed regarding um, do we allow transgender and non-binary and non, uh, gender non-conforming students to continue using the restroom that they're most comfortable with. And the federal guidance was no, we're not gonna do that. You have to use the bathroom of your assigned sex at birth. But HCC put out a statement that said, yeah, no, we're gonna keep our existing policy, which is that students can use whatever restroom they are most comfortable in, and nobody's gonna give them crap about that. Yeah. And I really liked that, that even when things change, you know, at the federal level, HCC always says, no, we protect our students, and we will continue doing whatever we need to do to protect our students, whether those are our immigrant students, our queer students, um, our black and brown students, we. Yeah, we always circle the wagons around our students. I appreciate that. So we've mentioned that Saga is a social group that also does some advocacy and education on campus. Does all that end when the meeting ends and then we just see each other next week? Yeah, no, it's very uh, uh, fluid, the, uh, the transition from, okay, the meeting's over, uh, we get away with hanging out in the room as long as there's not a class immediately afterward, because you know we do the clubs in, a regular classroom and as long as there's not a class afterward most of the buildings on this campus they're pretty good about just letting you hang out as long as you're not disruptive and we nine times out of ten we do that uh, especially if we were like watching a video or listening to music we'll just kind of quietly keep doing it <laughs> we'll say goodbye or we'll do their little wrap-up meeting uh, comments but then we'll keep doing that or if we're playing Kahoot that's the thing that we do all the time also if we're eating that's usually why we hang out around uh, and then we'll even if we have to be kicked out of the room uh, we uh, tend to take a walk over to the cafe over there and we'll get a meal and like sometimes I've been on campus like hours after my classes were ended and my shift was ended just because I was hanging out with the Saga people on the day of our meeting and then we do all sorts of like unofficial things together because we just become friends I think pretty much naturally as a consequence of being so tight-knit it's a very personal thing to organize around and you just unavoidably end up getting to know a lot about each other because of that. It's very nice. I think like 90% of my friends are from Saga. And it's, uh, it's I don't know, it's very uh, comforting 
to have that group that you can come to and they will pretty much uh, take you with open arms to just start hanging out because we all know that everyone in the LGBT community really needs that. They might not necessarily have anywhere else to go depending on how closet they are in the rest of their life. So I don't mean to make it sound like hanging out with me is, a, is like a, a social service I'm providing. I don't mean it that way. <laughs> just that uh, it felt that way for me. It was, uh, it was very helpful for me. And I think, oh, I'd like to think Joseph and I understand that as advisors, being advisors to Saga is not like advising any other club yeah. on campus. Joseph and I are on as advisors 24 seven. You all have our cell phone numbers. Um, if anything happens, we've had situations where students have um, told us that they've been kicked out of their homes at night and that cell phone's on and I'm calling people and Joseph is calling people and we're trying to figure out, can we get the student somewhere safe? Where are some shelters? What do we need to do? Uh, there's a, a whole network behind the scenes. So it's not just me and Joseph, it's, you know, I call counseling, I call the wellness center, I call just anybody on campus that I can think of yeah. and, and they, they always, always help. So it is something Advising this club is something that takes, it takes a lot. And, and there are some days when, you know, I sit down in my office and I'm just, because it can be so heart-wrenching what our students are going through. But um, at the end of the day, like you said, this might be the only place where they can be themselves. Yeah. And it is an honor to be able to provide that to students and to be somebody that they feel comfortable you know, knocking on my office door. Uh, we, I was joking earlier that my office is sometimes like Grand Central Station, especially right before a saga meeting is, I'll have half a dozen people crowded around the little table in my office, just waiting for, you know, us to walk over and, and get into the room and, and start our meeting. So it really is, it's, it's an incredible organization. And I love how we are all here for each other, no matter what, no matter when, no matter uh, you know what the situation is. If if I don't know how to help, if you don't know how to help, we'll find somebody who does know how to help. And I think that's a really valuable thing for our students to have, particularly if they don't have that support at home. Yeah, they know they can count on us. Yeah, definitely. We know from studies done by the Trevor Project and done in the Journal of Adolescent Health that when LGBTQ students have just one accepting adult in their life, that their mental health outcomes are better. They're less likely to harm themselves. They're less likely to be depressed or to be anxious. And that's a, something that I always lead with in the professional development sessions because we could be that one adult that one adult that says, I see you and you are valid and I love you just the way you are. I know how important it is to have people like that in, in my life and I haven't been a student in decades. So imagine how important it is for someone just out of high school, just discovering themselves to have that space and to have those friends that say, hey, yeah, we love you. Come on, let's go get some pizza. You know? <laughs> yeah, and I think like you, you, like you uh, mentioned a little bit, that's why I think it's so great that the Wellness Center is so supportive of our group specifically. I mean, they're supportive of everybody, but they have done a lot over the years to help Saga uh, meet our uh, event quotas and everything like that, is that there is unfortunately a lot of mental illness and substance abuse problems in the LGBT community as a result of having to self-medicate, having to deal with their... Uh, people who are supposed to be their loved ones, not loving them. And it's, uh, it's just a natural through line to have this place that's for regular uh, health and wellness to guide you if, they, if you open up to them and tell them that you're gay or trans or whatever, they can point you in this direction. They've been very helpful about that, about connecting students here. Yeah. Uh, Tara Rupp used to be one of our uh, faculty advisors. She's a great person. She and is. And I miss her. <laughs> <laughs> and Along with the Wellness Center, we have Student Life that does a lot of LGBT-focused um, events, which is, is fantastic. It, again, creates that sense of community, but opens it up to people who might not be in Saga, maybe students who don't really want to be in Saga, which is fine, they don't have to be, but they can still embrace their identity and, and do these different events. And then, of course, a shout out to the Counseling Center as well. They are yeah. they're wonderful. 
and uh, Records Registration and Veterans Affairs actually requested specifically a training on working with transgender students because they wanted to make sure that their processes were as inclusive as possible when they are helping students change their name which yeah. I thought was really fantastic. It's important for a place like that to be proactive about it because, I mean, the, the bureaucratic process involved in name changes is so daunting. It's very tempting to just not bother if you yes. have even an inkling of a, a doubt that the place is going to cooperate with you. So it's very important, I think, for those offices to be like, by the way, do you want to do this? 